Hello students, we're going to review what we did in class before break regarding enzymes. I just want to say a couple things. Um, the pen I'm working with is can be challenging, so my nice handwriting is gone. And um, so bear with me. Okay, so we were talking about the importance of enzymes in as biological catalysts that speed up reactions. And so we're going to look at this in more depth. Recall that the speed of reaction is the velocity or speed. And because in the body, we don't have the opportunity to increase and decrease, decrease temperature and shift equilibriums in that way, um, we require catalysts. Catalysts in the form of an enzyme is going to help us to increase the reaction rate. So just a little bit of review. Um, when we look at how concentration affects rate, we see that there's three common ways in chemistry. They're not the only ways, but they're the common ways that this is done. And so um, one is that the concentration affects the rate in what's called a first order reaction. So there's implied here is the one. And what this means is if we double the concentration of A, then the rate doubles two times. And remember our rate is the speed of the reaction. First order is going to be important for us in biochemistry in our enzyme discussion, so I'm going to highlight it with a little star. The next common way in chemistry that we see is that there are reactions that are second order. And that means that the rate is affected by doubling the concentration of the reactant in a slightly different way, which is that we double the amount of A, we see an increase in the rate by four. And therefore this exponent is two. So really the best way to think about the order of the reaction is to really think of them as exponents. Zero order is the idea that the exponent is zero. And so if I double the concentration of A and it's zero order, two to the zero mathematically is one. So that means that the rate doesn't change. And that's also gonna play a role in our discussion a little bit later on. So for biochemistry and where we're headed, the important one is the first order reaction and the zero order. Okay, so one of the important parts in biochemistry is the idea of a mechanism. And what this is, this is the idea that the overall reaction doesn't occur necessarily how it's written, that there's more than one step that's behind the scenes. I like to think of this as that we are pulling back the curtain, so to speak, and looking behind the scenes on what's happening in a reaction. So I'm going to start us off by looking at a general chem example. So here's our overall reaction of NO2 plus CO to make NO and CO2. And the behind the scenes, the nitty gritty of who's colliding with who are these two steps. So step one is NO2 and NO2 collide. So these are collisions. Oh, and you see where my pen issues come into play. So I'm gonna try to get fancy with my eraser and that did not help me so much. Okay, let me try it again, bear with me. So the steps are the collisions of who's colliding with who. So notice what's interesting here is that the first step does not involve CO, that's a reactant, it just involves NO2. And then they collide and they collide slowly. So this reaction is a slow rate to form NO3, which if you notice does not appear in the overall reaction. So that's what we call, oops, 
Bear with me. An intermediate. Okay, so that's our intermediate. Can I put it as an I? Okay, and then uh, NO3, because it's unstable, it very quickly collides with the other reactant CO to make product. So this would be our fast reaction. And the important thing in the study of reaction rate is that the slow step determines the rate. Okay, so let's kind of switch. I'm gonna press these because we talked about these guys in class, but let's go to this picture that we did and we can review what's written on those. Um, so here, here's our re reactants and here's our product. Notice what's happening is that free energy, free energy, so delta G is negative. So free energy is released. And remember, free energy that's released can be released to do work. Okay. Notice we have this energy barrier. So that's our activation energy. The greater the activation energy, the slower the rate. Oh, you know, when I try to write more naturally, it just kills me. So I have to focus more on how I hold the pen. So if we increase activation energy, the slower the reaction rate. Okay, so let's go to our next picture, which is the idea that, you know, of what happens when we add an enzyme. So notice here, up top here, this is without an enzyme. You have a very high activation energy, and with the enzyme, you have a smaller activation energy. And so delta G doesn't change. It's still negative, still exergonic in this example. You're not changing the overall energy that's being free energy that's being released. But what you are changing is you are lowering activation energy. So you're reaching a new transition state. And really what this is saying is that you're looking at a new mechanism. Ah, okay, I'll, I'll pull it together. So we're going to have here a new mechanism. OK, you got the point. All right. So let's take a look at um, what happens with enzyme and substrate combined to form an enzyme substrate complex and then what that means. So your enzyme and substrate, they are going to bind together and we're going to look at more details in a second, to form a complex. And um, why does this happen? You know, is because they're attracted to each other in some way. And what will be released is energy. And the energy released is called binding energy. It's the energy released. when an enzyme substrate complex forms. Okay, and then there goes, it goes up to what's called an enzyme transition state complex. That would be here. That would be at this top part of the diagram. And then ultimately the enzyme will let go of the product that's formed. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to explore a little bit more why, you know, why is energy released? And we're gonna ask the question, you know, why does this form? And we're gonna look a little bit more closely at that piece. Um, I also wanted to show you this, I added this in uh, today. Um, this is from your book. And what what is not shown is, so this is a little bit more in depth than the previous picture. And what we're seeing here is when the enzyme and substrate 
come together. There is a little bit of an activation energy here. You see it? But then it drops in terms of energy when they come together. And you see this energy that's released, that's our binding energy, okay? They want to bind, they want to attract, but not so much that you can't make product anymore. And so they still go on to form a transition state. This part here is where we see our catalysis. So this region here, as it moves towards that transition state, that's where catalysis occurs. Okay, so what are the factors that, you know, why do they bind what we're going to look at? You know, why are they binding? Why are they coming together? Is essentially, I'm going to try to do that again. Is in this region then, if I can get back my little pointy thing. So in this region of binding, we're going to see that as they come closer, they're going to attract via intermolecular forces. So we're going to see that they um, are going to have the hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, um, Van der Waals forces, all those forces that we learn and we spent a lot of time on. And then in this catalysis region, we're actually starting, this is where we're going to see some chemistry, some like chemical changes going on in there. You know, there's going to be chemical reactions. Okay, so since I'm on a roll with my pen, so our intermolecular forces here, these are again, hydrogen bonding, London dispersion, all those ones. And then our chemical reactions that we're going to see are going to be more like acid base, nucleophilic attacks, reactions with water. Oops. Okay, let me put that. So nucleophilic attacks, um, reactions with water. Okay, so this we'll come back to this in a little more depth in a few minutes. Okay, so just to resummarize here, when the enzyme and substrate bind, they attract via all those intermolecular forces, the energy drops they attract but they can't get so attracted that they don't want to make product so what will happen is you have this catalytic period where you end up at this transition state that's where these chemical reactions are going on acid base nucleophilic attack and then product is formed okay so the transition state is really really important um and we're going to see an example of it in a later uh, PowerPoint video. OK, um, I introduced this to you last minute um, before our break. And I just want you to realize that we're going to come back to this in um, another video. So this is going to be in a video on its own for serine protease. And so I'm going to click because we're going to come back to this in more detail. And so let's start this part. I don't believe we got to. So um, let's talk about enzyme specificity. And so what's interesting about that attraction of where is this is sort of the where the enzyme and substrate are going to attract each other, and that's going to be in a very important part of it called the active site. Usually the active site is a pocket of the enzyme or a groove um, where the substrate can bind. Um, there's going to be very, they're going to be, enzymes will be very highly selective for the substrates that they bind. And 
they have to come together before catalysis can occur. And so here's a nice little picture of an active site with a molecule in there. And they're going to have to complement each other, correct? So they're going to have to complement each other in terms of polarity. Um, so if your substrate is polar, then your active site would be polar. If the substrate's nonpolar, then the active site more than likely has residues that are nonpolar. Okay, if your substrate's negative, the active site will be positive. And remember these blobs, right? The blob here of this enzyme, those are those amino acids that we learned in the last couple chapters. Okay, so here's another one. Um, what's interesting about active sites is when the, the active site protein folds, um, you can have important residues in the active site that aren't necessarily next to each other in the primary sequence, okay? And the active site is a small three-dimensional pocket of the larger protein. Uh, they will have unique environments, and what this really means is that, um, again, they're going to complement whatever substrate's coming in there. So the pocket may be nonpolar might be polar, might be highly charged negative, might be highly charged positive. It all depends what the substrate is. Okay, so remember that um, we talked about the formation of ES and the idea of binding energy. That's when, that's the energy released when the ES forms. I know that's frustrating for me, really frustrating, this pen, but I sometimes do better than others. I will get better, hopefully, I can't guarantee it though. Okay, so the binding energy is the energy release when the enzyme and substrate bind together, and the multiple weak attractions are all those intermolecular forces. So in that picture that we looked at, that graph, we now, so here was the graph. Oh my goodness, I'm really brave in drawing it. A little bit and then it dropped. Remember that? I got to that lower point and then went back up. Right here, we're in the bottom part where they are attracted to each other via hydrogen bonding van der Waals, electrostatic, po positive to negative, and hydrophobic interactions. So that's an important discussion there that they're going to complement each other in terms of polarity. Okay, that didn't help. Okay. Um, the active site takes up a very small portion of the total volume of the enzyme. Uh, any extra amino acids that aren't involved in catalysis would help to hold the substrate in place. And so what's the advantage of an active site is you're keeping um, the substrate in, blocked in there to some extent with, with those weak, you know, with intermolecular forces but you prevent it from diffusing, right? So you prevent diffusion of the substrate, okay? So you're gonna prevent diffusion of that substrate. And that's really, really important, okay? Um, there's really two theories or models, I should say, models of how enzyme and substrates complement each other and, why, and how they bind. The first is a lock and key model that assumes that the active site is rigid and complements the substrate in shape. Uh, the induced fit model is really a more ex important discussion. It's the idea that as the substrate binds, there's some flexibility and then it can slightly change to match the shape of the substrate. So we've talked about 
conformational changes. It's it goes along with that kind of idea that they as they approach each other, those attractive forces kind of shift a little bit and makes it um, uh, not necessarily a rigid structure that they are flexible enough to kind of um, attract one another in the right way. Okay, so lock and key, kind of rigid discussion about how they attract, whereas uh, induce fit is that they come together and then there's this uh, distortion to the transition state. Okay. All right. So one more time here, we have enzyme and substrate bind binding, and then it reaches into that catalytic phase. I'm sorry, not up there here, catalytic phase. And um, the enzyme and transition state, when you when they finally reach that point where you have catalysis, um, there's they really complement each other at that point. And we're gonna come back to this idea um, when we look at the steering protease mechanism. So hold that thought on that because we're going to see the example in a later video.